go. All right. We are live, ladies and gentlemen. And you see this guy? You see this guy right here on your screens? His name is Jim Lakely. He is vice president of the Heartland Institute, director of communications, a regular staple on the In the Tank podcast, and an accessory to murder. Well, at least according to the latest opinion of a new report by the Harvard Environmental Law Review, is it just me or is climate uh, alarmist rhetoric getting crazier? Also, a new IPCC report just came out that uh, is apparently driving people insane. We're going to be talking about this and more on episode 391 of the In the Tank podcast. Welcome to the In the Tank podcast. As always, I'm your host, Donald Kendall. And joining me today, I've got the full crew. I've got Jim Lakely himself, like I said, a VP of the Heartland Institute, accessory to murder. How's it going, Jim Lakely? Uh, it's going pretty good, considering that I might be brought up on charges for uh, for mass murder, because uh, I don't believe that humans are causing a climate crisis. And I talk about that a lot, and we talk about that a lot at Heartland, so uh, we're going to talk about what kind of trouble we're all in. See, he admitted it. Case closed. Lock him up. Let's call the police in now. Also joining us, Justin Haskins, director of the Socialism Research Center here at the Heartland Institute. How are you doing today, good sir? You're probably culpable I'm... in all this as well. No, I, I'm not. I'm innocent. Um, I'm, uh, I'm <laughs> I, I, my. The only thing I have to say to uh, start off today's show is that we should lock Jim away and throw away the key. It's all done. <laughs> not not for climate related stuff. Just no. for everything else is going. On. Yeah, just in, just in general. <laughs> <laughs> also joining us, Chris Talgo, Editorial Director here at the Heartland Institute. How are you doing today, good sir? Doing good, and uh, you know, I just feel sorry for Jim. Jim, man. No, no. Hey, I'll bring no, it all. No. You guys are all coming down with me, man. You're yeah, all, Chris. All no, about. no, no. I think you I'm. I, I think I'm just going to become a rad and rad you out. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to turn state's evidence against me at the yes. Uh, yes. at the Hague. Couldn't, couldn't have to save myself. Sorry. Uh, so we do have a lot to get into, but before I do, I always have to put that message out there, except for last week when I forgot to, which is if you want to support the show, you can by just doing a couple of things, leaving a review for us on iTunes would be great, greatly appreciated. If you are watching this on YouTube, hitting that like button, uh, subscribing, sharing this content, even leaving a comment underneath the video all helps break through these big tech algorithms that prevent content like this from being shown to more people. Also, for those audio only listeners... That are catching the show on a Friday, you can join us a day earlier on Thursdays at noon central time where you can join us live on Facebook and YouTube and Rumble and Twitter and join the conversation, throw your comments and questions in there. Maybe we'll show your comments on the screen. Maybe we'll address your questions on the fly. But yes, we got a lot of heavy stuff to get into, a lot of heavy stuff. But the first thing I want to talk about, you know, before we get into the topic of uh, Jim Lakely being a murderer, uh, sorry, sorry, accessory to murder. Um, I, I can't briefly... wait to see what I can't wait to see what the algorithm does to this. You know, <laughs> when I'm when next time I watch YouTube, that'd be great. <laughs> that's, that's right. Uh, I want to briefly pick your brains about a new poll that came out. This was a poll conducted by the Wall Street Journal and that N O R C. I'm sure that stands for something. I don't know it off the top of my head. But uh, one part of the poll surveyed Americans on a number of topics. Among among them, trying to gauge how Americans feel about certain values. Uh, the poll asked people their opinions about the importance of patriotism, religion, community involvement, belief in God, marriage, having children. The poll was also a topic of an op-ed Chris wrote yesterday, which I believe was published in Town Hall, townhall.com. In the piece, Chris shows how all of these metrics um, were down substantially since the poll started in 1998. So, Chris, considering you wrote the piece, I want to give you first opportunity to say a few words about what struck you most about this poll. Hmm. What struck me most is how incredibly drastically our country has changed in 25 years, because the first poll was taken in 1998. 
And uh, as you can see, uh, most Americans agreed that patriotism was very important. I think it was 70 percent. Most believed that uh, having children was important. That was, I think, the high 60s, so on and so forth. Everything from belief in God to religion. Fast forward 25 years later, 2023, those numbers have been cut in half. So to me, that is just a huge like red alarm bell ringing uh, that our society and our culture has a lot of really, you know, big problems that need to be dealt with. Now, what I tried to do was just kind of go into some of the reasons why I think that this is happening. And I think that one of the main uh, culprits is the uh, public education system. And I wrote about my experience in the public education system, how when I was a kid going to school in the early 90s and the mid 90s, these things weren't they, you know, the, this anti-Americanism, this anti-patriotism, um, this just, you know, anti-Americanism in general was not what it is today. And I saw this happening when I attended a, a teacher college in Chicago in the, what was it, like 2012, 2013 time period, how they were basically preaching anti-American left-wing rhetoric to teachers in the hopes of uh, basically brainwashing and indoctrinating uh, children to become uh, anti-American. And what I'm thinking is that this is paying off and that uh, this new generation of Americans uh, is have become, uh, you know, indoctrinated into believing that America is a terrible country. And I think that this is going to have uh, far reaching uh, consequences. So I, I read this article, at least I read the first draft of it. Maybe it got changed when it got uh, published at Town Hall. But it seems like you're, uh, um, the, the source of this problem is a little bit more broad than just the school system. You say here, and I want to mm -hmm. bring Jim into this, says, although there is not one sole factor that is causing this trend, I think it is within reason to speculate that much of the newfangled apathy towards time-honored American values stems from the left's coordinated attack via Hollywood, academia, the mainstream media, social media, and a plethora of other places that is intended to achieve one simple goal, make Americans believe our country is not exceptional so that they can transform the nation from what it was built upon into what they want it to become. So, uh, Jim... I mean, do you think that that uh, that is kind of the core issue that is kind of underlying all the plummeting of all of these numbers in this poll? Yeah. Uh, when I read Chris's piece in Town Hall, I was uh, it made me think of Obama and his campaign on hope and change. And uh, we were just we're just five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. Uh, and I remember uh, radio host uh, Dennis Prager had mentioned it's like, uh, try that line on your wife. <laughs> say that I love you, but I think you need a fundamental transformation. Uh, so he was tapping in to what uh, Chris had already seen going on uh, in his teaching career. But, you know, this is 2008. And so if you have to fundamentally transform a country, that means you think it's broken. You think it's it's evil. And these things have only gotten worse um, that that they're taught, as Chris mentioned in this piece and, and here on this podcast, you know, he went to he went to get a master's degree in education and he was being indoctrinated by his professors to not teach children how to think, but what to think and importantly, what to think about their country. And what they think about their country is that it's 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 broken. It's racist. It's wrong. Uh, it's it's a, not a force for good in the world. I mean, there's been polls. This isn't that poll, but there's been polls where they've asked. Do you think the United States on balance has been a force for good or for ill in the world? And I think ill is winning or it's very close to winning uh, in, in the minds of Americans today. And that's because indoctrination is powerful. Propaganda works. And so if you keep telling generations of, of, of American children that their country is broken, that uh, racism is rampant, that America is evil, this is what you end up with. You end up with a with a uh, with a country that doesn't really have a purpose anymore. You you end up degrading the culture. It's, there's a cultural rot, and again, Chris mentions it in the in his op ed that this doesn't this is not just in academia. It's in Hollywood. It's it's everywhere. We have a cultural rot in America where if you know seventy percent of people thought patriotism was a good thing and that's important for people to be patriotic about their country and to have that cut in half or you know a majority of people don't believe that anymore. That's the, this is what you get. This is what you get from our system and that's basically with a cultural rot at its center now. Uh, so Justin, what what are your thoughts on just? Any of the results? I don't know if you looked at the poll specifically or just anything that's been said so far by uh, 
anyone on this panel. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of. Um, I, I think this is a really disturbing thing, and 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 frankly, it's not just what people think. I think we we have a tendency to we see polls like this and we think, oh yeah, well you know these people have this really negative view of America, and and that's sort of. Uh, you know, spilling into various other problems in society, policy positions, uh, elect, uh, uh, things that are happening with elections and candidates who are being voted in who otherwise may not be and maybe AOC and stuff like that. Um, and, and I think that's all true. But I think that it's it's actually metastasized to the point where some really, really radical policy positions are now becoming uh, pretty standard, pretty normal amongst younger people. And I think that it, so it's not just that they have this generally bad view or are generally anti-American or anti-traditional uh, American view of things. Um, it's that it's actually now leading to specific policies that are um, cra really crazy in a lot of ways. Um, so I want to give you an example of this. I was not prepared. <laughs> preparing to do this at all. So I'm trying to do this on the fly, but we did a poll, um, in July, 2022 with Rasmussen, the Heartland Institute did. And, uh, we asked a bunch of questions about Americans attitudes, um, on just, uh, this is for voters, uh, voters attitudes on, uh, America generally on the Supreme court, on the constitution, on uh, a bunch of sort of institutions in America. Okay. And what they wanted to do about those institutions and the results, we haven't talked about this in a while, but this, this is the thing that immediately popped in, uh, into my mind when I was listening to Chris and, and Jim make those comments that they were just making. Um, the, the, the number of people who want to basically gut the constitution, abolish the Supreme court, and do other kinds of sort of really crazy things is scary high, scary high. Uh, for example, um, when we asked, would you strongly favor, somewhat favor, or somewhat oppose, or strongly oppose legislation that would abolish the current Supreme Court, okay, abolish it, 54% of people 19 to 39 said, yes, strongly favor or somewhat favor, okay, more than half said that they would want to abolish the Supreme Court. When we asked people if they would strongly favor, you know, all that stuff, a constitutional amendment that would give the United Nations the authority to reverse U.S. Supreme Court decisions that U.N. members believe that violate human rights. So, so if the U.N. decides they don't like a Supreme Court decision in the United States, would you support legislation that would allow the U.N. to overturn U.S. Supreme Court cases, the answer was 48% of 19 to 39-year-olds said yes. 48%! Okay, and then when we asked just sort of general questions about the Supreme Court, similar to what this poll is showing, when we asked about America, the Constitution, Supreme Court, the numbers were overwhelming. Uh, about half said that the Supreme Court is racist, uh, about a more than half, 54% uh, said that they believed that the Supreme Court was sexist. Um, uh, when we asked about the Constitution, um, it said that 55% uh, of 19 to 39-year-olds said that the U.S. Constitution is sexist. 59% uh, said racist. If we asked if the Supreme Court, we asked if the Constitution, I forgot about this question, should be mostly or completely rewritten. 51% of 19 to 39 year olds said mostly or completely rewrite the constitution that they would favor that. So, I mean, when, when, when it's not just that, uh, so I'm not disagreeing with anything that Chris and Jim said, it's, it's really worse than what this <laughs> poll, this NORC WSJ poll is showing. It's way worse than that. It's not just, well, you know, our attitudes and opinions and views of America and what it means to be American and traditional values and things like that have changed. Um, and what we care about has changed. Yeah, okay. That's 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 all true. But they want to now blow up like all the existing protections for individual rights. Just destroy them. Just crush them. Give the United Nations power over our Supreme Court. Abolish the Supreme Court and create something entirely differently. Rewrite the Constitution of the United States. Let's just rewrite it. I mm. mean, 
this is we are headed for really really dark really really dark times and uh the last thing that i'll say is and i don't have uh this number in front of me but it's in here somewhere and there's been lots of other polls that have been done on this question as well but when you ask people about whether they would favor the united states basically splitting apart and having a national divorce an Mm. increasingly higher number of people on both the republican and democratic side are saying yes to that and the reason is because we fundamentally can't even agree now whether the supreme court should be overruled by the united nations or not like we don't even agree on that right? right and so we are becoming fundamentally different societies and it's a huge, huge problem. And Chris is exactly right. And Jim is exactly right. The education system is the foundation upon which all of that ideology was built. It was a deliberate tactic put into place in by starting in the progressive era, but really picking up pace in the 1960s. And it has only gotten worse since then. And until we get our kids out of public schools or fundamentally transform the public school system of the United States of America, we are not going to be able to reverse this trend. And we may not be able to do it anyway at this point. It may be too late. Chris, there was a, there was one finding that I found particularly interesting. Uh, but before I get into that, was there anything, was there one of these uh, percentages, one of these poll results that, uh, that like specifically stand out to you that you want to address? Um, no, I mean, I think it, most of them, you know, were, you know, I, I assumed that they were going to be as bad as they were. Um, one of the things that I think is uh, fascinating is the question of, is politics downstream of culture is culture downstream of politics? And Andrew Breitbart, who we named our event space after, and I think he's a titan in the uh, conservative, you know, uh, movement. He almost always argued that uh, politics was downstream of culture. And I think that that is a very interesting uh, way of looking at it because what the left has done, uh, like Justin said, since, you know, the start of the progressive eras, they have gone into the institutions and those institutions are the media, their academia, their Hollywood, you know, there's, you know, just the major institutions and they have, uh, you know, put this poison into those institutions. And that I think is now, you know, creating this generation who believe these things because they have, you know, just been bombarded from all angles with this, you know, cultural poison. So I don't think that politics is the answer. I think that, like Justin said, we have to, we conservatives, you know, we, uh, you know, uh, American patriots have to create institutions that uh, peddle what we, you know, are pushing. And I think that, and I said this at the end of the uh, piece is that we should not be completely like, you know, uh, putting our heads on you know on fire here because we've seen the school choice renaissance recently and you know throughout history we've seen the pendulum swing back and forth in the 1960s you know when uh the uh you know hippie movement was just in full swing and you had you know massive protests and you know a bunch of people that were you know saying you know america is a terrible country well eventually that kind of subsided in the 1980s we had a you know a resurgence of patriotism i'm not saying that that's going to happen again in the in the 2020s but what i'm saying is it's not set in stone guys guys this nah. is monumental chris with an optimistic view on something well, with, as as big as this this is He's usually the naysayer of the podcast. Well, but Tanya, so. <laughs> I'm not. I, I well, I'm not. I'm not like putting my rose-colored glasses on by any means. I'm just saying that we shouldn't. We shouldn't just say that it's all over. Sure. But what I'm saying is, is that you know, the pendulum does swing back and forth, and I think that so, you know, right now it's definitely swung in uh, the wrong direction. So the finding that I found most striking from this was the percentage of Americans who said having children was very important. So apparently when this poll was first done in 1998, uh, that percentage was 59%. Now in 2023, it's down to 30%. So it nearly halved. This number nearly halved in 25 years. And when I hear this, and, and this is as somebody that's done their fair share of research on topics like climate alarmism and population control, I can't help but think that the rhetoric behind these the world is ending claims is artificially driving this number specifically lower and lower every year. And the one paper that I always cite 
uh, when I talk about this idea of population control titled Population Engineering and the Fight Against Climate Change. This is authored by academics at Georgetown University and John Hopkins University, where they put as a policy suggestion, quote unquote, preference adjustment, where propaganda would be used in the media and news and TV and schools and billboards and everywhere to essentially condition people to want to have fewer kids. This was a policy suggestion outlined in this academic paper. Also, when you have people like AOC going on Instagram and talking about how people justifiably factoring in climate change, their decision to have kids, like all of this is driving that number lower and lower and lower. Uh, but Justin, I cut you off. You were going to say something. Yeah, I I don't think that the poll results gave us the um, they didn't give us the cross tabs for ideology and stuff like that. Right? We don't have that. Do I, you know I found some. That? I did, and the uh, the difference between Republicans and Democrats on most of the issues that I highlighted was so stark. It was almost uh, like a two to one ratio. Do, do, do you happen to remember or, or have in front of you by any chance? I know I'm, I, I don't I'm putting people on the spot, but the uh, the cross tabs for the question about children and and Republicans and conservatives, and, uh, because the reason I ask is I've seen things in the past. And on, on, on that specific question, Republicans answered that it was very important um, at a much higher rate than uh, Democratic right. voters. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would. I, what's really interesting is I've seen this argument made before. Not not a ton, but it's actually it's a very interesting argument um, that essentially because this attitude that conservatives and it's spilling over into Republicans because most Republicans are conservatives have of children that seems to be much more positive <laughs> that they want kids at a much higher rate. Conservatives and Republicans. Um, actually in the long run could have a a really dramatic impact on the demographics of the country politically because statistically they've they've done analyses that show that um your if your parents are conservative you're more likely to be conservative it's not guaranteed or anything like that but you're more likely statistically mm -hmm. and the same thing is true with liberals okay but because conservatives are having more children and they have a more positive outlook on children over time, you're going to have more conservative people if everything just holds true to the way that it is now, just because conservatives are having more kids and your kids, if you're conservative, are more likely to also be conservative. And because liberals are having so few kids, uh, Americans in general are having too few kids, but because liberals are having so few kids compared to conservatives, they're actually... Um, not able to even replace their current numbers just with children. And so over time, America could end up becoming significantly more conservative purely just because conservatives <laughs> want to have kids and liberals don't want to have kids. And that alone by itself is, is going to be a huge determining factor, which makes the education system all the more important, right? Because this is all, uh, everything that I've been saying is based on a, a America where the education system is ruled already by liberals. So can you imagine if you didn't have uh, the education system completely ruled by liberals, how much more that number would be even uh, the, the difference, the gap would be even starker and how transformative that could theoretically be. So one of the best things that you could actually do as a conservative is have kids. It's one of the best things that you could actually do is have kids and teach them the values that you have over the long I'm run. On it, everybody well, I'm on it. I'm actually that. waiting for a call <laughs> yeah, right yeah. now to see if my second kid I is know on the that. Way. Any minute know, now, yeah. But you're a patriot for it, <laughs> Donald. You're but, a patriot. but what about but what about the wide open border and the fact that we've got millions upon millions and millions of people coming into this country? Right, we're, and, we're not going to start that. That we're going to well, talk well, for it, 45 minutes about that, Jim. Go ahead. I want to give you final. All words. I'm saying is that all I'm saying, Donnie, is that the is that the liberal. Multifaceted. Got it. Got it. Jim, go ahead. All right. Yeah. I mean, so, so yeah, it's, <laughs> Justin, you talked about that. There's a reason why people are starting to talk about a nat national divorce now. And it's because uh, the left and the right do not share very many common values at all. Uh, the left thinks that this is a evil racist country. People on the right think it's a good country and that you should be patriotic and you should love your country. Um, and then you could go down. There's an entire list of these things. But uh, yeah, you talk about 
I guess the idea that conservatives are going to um, breed our way back to <laughs> back to a, a normal country again, uh, which that is a be nice Trump's thought. new campaign. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but. Uh, but yeah, so so but the left controls everything. So you may have so if you're a, if if you're conservative, um, you may have kids that are con, that are raised right and are raised to love this country and are raised conservative. But then you send them off to Oberlin or Harvard or even my alma mater, the University of Pittsburgh, and then after a semester they come back miserable leftists who have rejected everything you spent 18 years teaching them uh, and to and in inculcating your own values into their. Uh, into their brains, into their minds, and and into their global outlook. It is nearly impossible. I can't even think of a liberal parent sending their kid off to college and having them come back loving America or saying mm -hmm. that this is not a racist country or that critical race theory is garbage. Uh, because one, there's, there's very few uh, universities and colleges in this country that would actually teach those values. One of them, of course, being Hillsdale College. We've had a lot of Hillsdale people as interns here at the Heartland Institute. They've always been fantastic and outstanding. But there's no way a liberal parent is going to send a kid to Hillsdale. Uh, so, but there, there is an enormous risk that you send your kid off to college and they come back miserable, brainwashed leftists. And so as long as the left controls the culture and especially academia, uh, this it doesn't matter that liberals aren't having kids. They got your kids. They're going to take your kids and turn them into leftists. My my, my point was that the, the research that's been done on this is taking that into account already. The numbers are taking that into account. The liberals are in charge of everything. Think about it like think about it like this. Uh, I'm I'm uh, I grew up in a super liberal part of America. Donnie grew up in a super liberal part of America, and Chris grew up in a super liberal part of America. And yet, we're not brainwashed liberal, you know, sycophants, and we're not you know morons who have been indoctrinated <laughs> by the school system. Chris, you went to a public school, right? Yep. I know Donnie did, and I did too. So we all went to liberal public schools. We all grew up in liberal parts of the country and we're all not crazy liberals. Now, my parents are conservative. And I know that Chris, I rule. know that Chris's dad at the very least is a, is a common sense conservative guy. Uh, yeah. Donnie, I don't know anything about your parents. You're an orphan basically, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> but your parents are not like whack job leftists as far as I know. Right. So nope. do you see my point? Like it is, it, it's not as simple as just, well, automatically every kid that goes to public school is a, is a leftist. My point is some of them do become leftists and you're right, Jim. I don't think that the kids who grow up in left-wing homes are likely to become conservatives. That's probably true, but there's so few kids growing up in liberal homes relative to conservatives. The numbers eventually shake up. Even if you lose some conservative kids, the statistics still show that you're more likely to be conservative if you grew up in a conservative household and it all kind of works itself out. And the, and the point is we shouldn't send them to Oberlin. Why are you sending your kids to Oberlin? <laughs> you should lose, you should lose your parent card. If you're sending your kid to Oberlin, stop but, university but, of Pittsburgh. That was a nice place, Jim, but, when you went there. Now it is a liberal hellhole. Stop sending kids there. You know what I mean? That's, Part of the problem. Don't Donnie, do I, that anymore. Donnie, I, I assume we want to move on here, but just, just to respond to what Justin was saying. So I went to I'm a, gonna give uh, you a final word since sure, this is okay. your topic. You wrote about final word, and then we're moving okay, on. Okay, because this this you know harkens back to the piece. So I was saying in the piece that in the mid to early 1990s, when I was in school and I was in uh, public high school in the later 1990s, there wasn't nearly as much left-wing ideology just being crammed down our throats. I went back to the same high school in about 2015, 16, 17 to do my student teaching. And then I was hired there and I was just shocked at the same teachers who are still there who now were pushing this crazy left wing you know, ideology on their students. So even in the time span of two decades, I saw a humongous change in that high school. I then moved down to South Carolina, which is a conservative state and worked at a public a couple of public high schools there. And it was the same thing. I was one of the a few people uh, in the entire school, uh, one of the few teachers who actually was like, hey, is this like, should we be doing this? Like, isn't this kind of wrong? Like, we shouldn't be like indoctrinating students. But we were the exception. We were not the norm. And uh, Justin, I, I agree with you that studies have shown uh, that over generations, kids tend to take on the political beliefs of their of their parents normally. But their peers are also a huge uh, influencer and the fact that this is becoming like, you know, so prevalent 
in in grade school i mean look at what's happening in kindergartens like transgender stuff i mean this is insane i think that that is changing the uh you know like the entire baseline here where now they are they are just being flooded with this stuff at an early age away from their parents and the parents are only having a very small impact but their peers and their teachers are having a much greater impact because they're in school five days a week, eight hours a day. Well, I, ha- I have my uh, I have my boy watching Red Dawn and Rocky Four uh, on a daily basis. <laughs> Good. So he is going to be a flag waving patriot from, uh, you know, from day one of, of kindergarten. But I do want to move on. We got to move on. We're already halfway through the episode. Everyone's like, oh, you're going to talk about the main topic or not. So we're, let's get to it. So uh, it seems to me like climate change alarmism, the the rhetoric behind all of this stuff is getting crazier and crazier. And I've got two stories that kind of back up this claim. One, like I mentioned at the the beginning of this episode, is a new paper that was published by Harvard uh, Environmental Law Review, which argues that oil companies and their executives should be charged with murder. So I'm reading from an article uh, talking about this in The Guardian. It says the striking and seemingly radical legal theory is laid out in a paper accepted for publication in the Harvard Environmental Law Review. In it, the authors argue fossil fuel companies, quote, have not simply been lying to the public. They have been killing members of the public at an accelerating rate and prosecutors should bring that crime to the public's attention. Continuing the quote, what's on the ledger in terms of harm, there's nothing like it in human history, said one of the authors of the piece. So uh, this is all built on the premise that oil companies knew that their products are contributing to climate change for decades, and they chose to lie to the public so that they continue to sell their planet poison, mm-hmm. which has led to droughts and floods and pain and misery and forest fires and chaos and death. Therefore, they should be tried for murder. And it's important to point out that this isn't just the lunatic ravings of some nobody on Twitter. This is a published article in the Harvard Environmental Law Review authored by academics, including a law professor at George Washington University. Uh, So, Jim, since you're probably the most likely to be charged first as an accessory to these crimes, I'll let you have first whack at this topic. Well, gosh, uh, I don't know how much I should say. I mean, uh, it may be used against me in the court of law. Uh, Look, the the Harvard paper, the reason, you know, we wanted to bring this up as a topic today, um, and it's, I think, a broader discussion about basically the mainstreaming of of radicalism. Um, It would have been laughed, laugh out loud absurd to suggest that uh, oil companies um, you know, or fossil fuels, let's just even take that out, that fossil fuels have not uh, helped humanity in ways that are almost too much, you know, too large to calculate that uh, human flourishing, you know, the, the world population and human flourishing just kind of bump it along at the bottom of a graph for millennia. And then, oh, gosh, look at this stuff. We can burn it and we can invent engines and things that can make life easier. And uh, every aspect of human of human life um, since the humans have been walking this earth have it have improved because of this and so but now we've mainstreamed this is not some you know even though the article was in the guardian which is a, a radical left-wing uh rag that is um peddling climate alarmism um as if they get paid to do that by the word and they probably do it this is this isn't a prestigious harvard uh you know this is a, a prestigious paper published by harvard university and the paper said, as a, stated as fact, that fossil fuels and big oil are directly responsible already for killing thousands and thousands of Americans, let alone what's going on around the world, that, that our use of fossil fuels has killed thousands and thousands of American citizens. Just declared, just declared by Harvard in this paper, uh, or in this paper published by, by Harvard, and then they just move on. And so we've gone from uh, we, so now it's to the point where they, they're mainstreaming the idea that uh, big oil has had knew, knew that this that their product was going to harm the earth and kill thousands and untold millions of people. And they continued forward with it anyway. And for this, they must be held accountable and charged with homicide. And of course, all of those who also think that the use of fossil fuels is is good. And that humans are not causing a climate crisis through their use, that that, you know, climate climate catastrophe is not on the way 
because of what we're doing. We talk about this all the time. The Heartland Institute is globally known for our work on climate change and climate realism and, frankly, the benefits of using fossil fuels and then and our, the need that doesn't exist to get rid of them and to transition to, to green technology, which will actually... So, you know, if you want to flip this around, you know who's really going to be guilty of homicide if we're going to go there, if we're going to say that um, a, a certain public policy makes you personally culpable for the murder of human beings? Green energy companies. If we were to actually transition all the way to wind and solar, billions of people on this earth will die. They will starve. They will freeze to death. That is the real threat in the, in the, in, on the globe right now. Not big oil, not the use of fossil fuels. So yeah, let's. If they really want to go down there, uh, we're going to see how that works out for them. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, Texas with their what was that like a year and a half ago with their little cold spell, and because of their over reliance on on wind and solar, they like resulted in way more chaos than what otherwise would have been. <laughs> I think it's a, a much easier line to connect there than to just like ignore the other half of the ledger when you're balancing out the pros and cons of using hydrocarbons for your energy source for your country. But uh, that is a good point. Uh, so what is to be done if you know these people making this case get their way? Well, again, reading from the Guardian article, it says, mm -hmm. the authors go as far as to recommend a particular sentence should fossil fuel firms be found guilty of homicide restructuring them as public benefit corporations similar to what happened to Purdue Pharma as part of its settlement for contributing to the opioid crisis. Doing so, they argue, would allow for the rapid winding down of fossil fuel production to reduce further climate harm while ramping up investments in clean energy and protecting workers and communities tied to fossil fuel companies. So from what I can glean from just the, the research that I did on Purdue Pharma, uh, it, it seems like that was the first time that uh, a company has ever been transformed into a public benefit corporation as a result of legal action. And from what I can understand, uh, this is as close to nationalizing a company as you can get without the government actually taking ownership of this. So, uh, Justin, I'm going to go to you. What do you think about all of this? Is this just like old man yells at clouds level of thinking here? Or do you think that any element of this actually has some legs? Yeah, I, I think they could do this. I mean, would, would it really surprise would it really surprise you? I mean, I, again, the, the idea if, if they had enough political power, I think there is no doubt whatsoever that the um, progressive wing of the Democratic Party and the socialist wing of the Democratic Party, and they're not exactly the same thing, um, would absolutely do everything in their power to destroy the entire fossil fuel industry in America, in Europe, and everywhere in the world. That's what they would do if they could. Now, they haven't had the power to do that yet, thankfully, but if they could, that's what they would do. And part of that would require, it would necessitate either outlawing fossil fuels outright, by phase, probably by phasing them out in a relatively rapid period of time, um, and that could be done in a bunch of different ways, but this would be a really convenient way of doing it because instead of just passing a law that says we're going to ban fossil fuels and now they're all accountable for that, you get a court case that says uh, we're going to put the radical activists in charge of the Exxon Mobil and they're just going to deliberately run it into the ground. And that's a lot easier to do politically, frankly, than pass a law that says we're going to ban this stuff outright and then everybody's uh, energy bills go through the roof and the price of everything goes up and everyone's uh, unhappy and angry and electing things. In this case, who do you blame? The judge that uh, approved all of this? You know, it's it's a lot easier politically to do this. And that is exactly why the left has done a lot of their, their environmentalism, their radical environmentalism has been done through the court system, through sue and settle agreements where they sue the government um, on environmental grounds, and then the government, which agrees with these left-wing activists, agree settles the lawsuit, and so they don't even have to go to court. They just settle it. So, I mean, I could see all kinds of things happening um, along these lines because this is exactly the sort of thing that the left wants to do in order to destroy um, the, the fossil fuel industry in order to force everybody to move in the direction of um, renewable energy sources. I will say this. I think it is kind of hilarious in a way that the punishment for um, from the perspective of these people is basically socialism. Like that's the punishment. 
Like, oh, Absolutely. you, oh, you, you know, you, you guys were really bad. So you have to be socialists now. And well, okay, we're so just going to destroy you through socialism. It's like, yeah, that's pretty much how socialism works. So it's, this, it's interesting public- that that's the punishment. I can't imagine anything worse than having people take over who are a bunch of socialists deliberately. It, it, they all acknowledge this is going to run into the ground. I think that's kind of hilarious. Well, but, this, this know. public benefit corporation, when I was looking at it, it was like making sure that the corporation also aligns their uh, – you know, the, the way that they do business to align with like the, the stakeholders and society right. and all of this stuff. So you call it socialism. The first thought that went to my head was like, oh, yeah, this is just like a more, yeah, a more like, yeah. <laughs> if I got sent- ESG, right? Like it's just like a more concentrated version of ESG. That's what it seemed like to me. If I got sentenced to socialism, I might want to appeal and just try to go to jail instead. <laughs> Chris, yeah. uh, I want to bring you into this conversation. What are, what are your thoughts on anything that's been said so far on this topic? I can't believe we're even having this conversation, but I remember when uh, Joe Biden was campaigning in 2020 and uh, someone asked him uh, if he would be amenable to put uh, oil company executives in jail. And it was an off the cuff response, but he said yes. And I also remember during the many. Yeah, well, no, that's back when he didn't have that weird whisper thing going on. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) That's back when he was, you know, more sane. Uh, But. Also on the on the uh, campaign uh, stump, many times they were asked, "Will you will you just ban fossil fuels?" And he said, "Yes." So we've seen Joe Biden in two years now on the job, basically take a wrecking ball to the fossil fuel industry. So this, to me, is like the next step. I I could see the you know the oil industry being framed as the new tobacco industry of you know the 2020s, and yeah, who knows it- what what that could entail. Yeah, and and I think that just it, it, I I know I always say this, but I, I want to. It's important that we reemphasize this over and over and over again. It, Chris just mentioned the tobacco industry. That's a great point. To p- a lot of people on the left, they look at this and they say um, this is akin to a drug company that knew that they were you know effectively killing people or putting a product out there without the fair warnings or the tobacco companies knowing that their product was more dangerous than they let on and not putting that warning out there for people so that they could do this. They see this as, as being the same sort of thing, right? They see this as a really dangerous action, a really, uh, um, uh, not even reckless, like a deliberately dangerous action where they're, that's why they're using things like murder or, you know, that, that kind of stuff. That's why these things keep getting evoked. That's how they see this. Well, if you really truly believe that everyone's going to die from climate change, you really truly believe that, or that's the position that you're putting out there. And you know that these people, you really truly believe that these people know that they are contributing to that thing that's killing everyone. Then yeah, what this is a totally reasonable thing. Is it not? It would be like the yeah. equivalent of people taking chemicals and just dumping them into the water supply. And sure. they know that that's what they're doing. And you know that that's see. So it, it, a lot of this stems from that underlying assumption. Like if well, you well, buy into the mind. underlying assumption, then you're yeah, going to yeah. come to this kind of conclusion. Right, right, right. Keep that in mind. Cause I, the, the second part of this conversation, I want to get into something that ties a little bit more closely to that. But I was just, uh, you know, after seeing this, I was just doing a little bit of Googling because I know that this wasn't the first time some case like this has been made uh, that, you know, people should be tried for murder or something like that. If there's some oil executive or God forbid, a climate denier. So I did just a little bit of Googling and I found a couple of examples. Uh, one of them, there was actually uh, uh, an article, a Heartland article written about this is a 10 year old story, but I thought it was just so crazy. I had to bring it up about a professor from some university in Austria who argued for the death penalty for climate warming deniers. So just being a denier, death penalty. You know what? Death penalty. You, you, you say something bad about solar and solar and wind, death penalty. <laughs> like that's, that's, that's the thinking of some of these people. Uh, a letter sent to Obama in 2015 signed by climate scientists from George Mason University arguing that his administration should, be, should use... Uh, uh, to in- should investigate oil companies uh, using RICO laws because they are knowingly deceiving the public about climate change. In 2022, uh, just last year, a town in Puerto Rico sues big oil companies alleging collusion in climate change uh, messaging. 
James Hansen, who we talk about on this podcast a fair amount, has argued in the past for oil companies to be tried for crimes against humanity. And I swear there was something about Sheldon Whitehouse specifically targeting the Heartland Institute. Am I mistaken something, Jim? Uh, you've been in this field a little bit longer than I have. Uh, are there other examples of this type of rhetoric that come to mind for you? Well, you should see some of the Twitter replies I get uh, from people. <laughs> uh, they, they tell me that uh, in the future, and they're fully confident that in the future there will be, um, you know, trials. There'll be public trials, and all those who denied climate change uh, will be held to account, um, and uh, you'll be going to jail or worse. I mean, it, this this kind of ties back into what we started the podcast talking about: is the indoctrination. Of entire generations of children into believing these things as, as justin said if you truly believe if you truly believe and a lot of people do that basically living our lives that that human flourishing is going to bring about the death and destruction of our civilization and the planet or whatever you know it's going to kill all the polar bears or it's going to you know it's going to end all the crops whatever if you, if you really believe in this catastrophism you're one you're a lunatic and two, you think that these sorts of punishments for those who do not think what you think are justified and that you should be charged with these heinous crimes because you, you climate denier, you are personally responsible for the destruction of the planet. And so we're going to hold you to account. That way, this will never happen again. And so but they've been indoctrinated into these things. I mean, you, we've seen we talked about it on the uh, climate change roundtable show a couple of weeks back um, where we had kind of like a March Madness bracket and getting to the finals was the idea of, um, you know, of what's like the, the biggest myth that is important to rebut in the public space. And uh, one of them was was basically climate anxiety and climate depression, or as we called it, climate PTSD. Gotcha. The idea that there, there is a sizable population uh, of human beings on this earth who are absolutely um, beyond help when it in anxiety because they think that humans are, are killing the planet that they think carbon dioxide emissions uh, are are is, is actually pollution and is choking us all to death um and fighting back at that is really important because you know it, it again it would have been considered absolutely nutty and insane mm -hmm. in say the year 2000 to to, to suggest that homicide charges should be brought against uh, oil executives or those who, you know, who don't believe in the climate catastrophism, that, that you should be brought up on charges. It would have been absolutely insane to think that. And it actually right. it still is insane. Yet here it is so uh -huh. mainstreamed and it gets it gets legs because a sizable part of the population is completely brainwashed into believing absolute falsehoods. Yeah, you know, Johnny, for McDonald's to be brought up on charges for the mass murder of everyone that's died of a heart attack or something like that. Yeah, it's coming. Well, uh, it's 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 pretty it's pretty uh, ironic that in a day and age in which murderers are literally just walking away scot free, they're actually going to go uh, and and try to or even thinking about charging people with murder because they've, like Jim said, provided substances that have. Uh, you know, allowed for human flourishing more than ever before. But Donnie, if if anyone has any question that the climate change uh, cult is not a cult, this is it. This is Spanish Inquisition. You know, mm. here here we go again. We've seen this movie before. If you do not tow to the to the you know doctrine, well, then you are going to be on the out. And if you're on the out, well, then you know bad things are going to happen to you. Yeah, so this you know, is this is this is not based on science. Well, one one other thing too, just kind of, you know. One of the things that, and I'm not suggesting that we do this because I think that it's wrong that people do this in a free society, but one of the advantages that the left seems to have over our side is that our side is unwilling to make the same kind of argument that they make in this, in this way, right? Yeah. So even though I believe and can empirically show that there are certain policies that the left adopts that leads to people dying. I would never come out and say they should be convicted of murder. And I don't know anyone on the right that would, right? And so they have this advantage of doing this. Like, I'll give you a specific example related to this exact kind of thing. Um, uh, H. Sterling Burnett, who's the head of the Robinson Center, and I saw earlier, he actually let, put up a little comment. This is part of the reason why I was thinking of this. Um, head of the Robinson Center, way back my early days of Heartland, uh, explained to me, that there is a government analysis. This has been in place for a long time. That's it has to do with in in particular cars 
and how they design cars for fuel efficiency. And they actually have a calculation that shows that the more fuel efficient they make the car, the less safe the car is if it gets into a car accident. There's actually a government calculation for how many people are dying. Additional people die in order to have more fuel efficient cars. So we don't make cars as safe as they could be. We actually reduce the safety in the car on purpose so that it's more fuel efficient. Well, but that means that deliberately we are killing people. We're literally making the cars so that they're more likely that people will die in them so that they will be more fuel efficient, right? right? Now, could I come out? Now, this has been around a long time. I couldn't believe it when he told me about that. This has been around for a long, long time. I think the calculation goes back originally to like the 1990s or something like that. So are these people murderers? Because they are deliberately putting policies into place that are that they know they don't. I, this is not like you and me, like Jim. Okay, Jim. Jim doesn't actually believe that fossil fuels are killing people. He doesn't believe that, right? He thinks on net it's actually a benefit for people. That's what Jim actually believes, and there's no evidence on the planet that will show that Jim doesn't believe that. But this is a calculation that says, yeah, we know this is going to kill people, but we are going to do it anyway. That's, that's, it's a government report. So how is it that th that's the case that these people are guilty of murder, if this is how we're going to start talking and communicating with each other, um, is much stronger right. on the left for things like that that's than a, it ever would be. That's a much on more someone direct like Jim. line. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah, but, but, but to we know don't communicate Jim's that way. But to know Jim's true thoughts, we are going to have to uh, get your diary. So get it from underneath your your mattress. We have to read through it. It's going to all be open court. Um, if, if the Biden family has taught us anything, it's taught us that that's the only place that we really tell our true feelings is in our diaries. <laughs> Good point. So. All right. So we have like 10 minutes left. I want to move on to the second part of this story. Uh, so this is the, the second piece that I want to use as an example of how this like rhetoric is just seemingly amping up this climate change rhetoric. So this is a an article from the Washington Post titled Why Climate Doomers Are Replacing Climate Deniers. So in this article, the author explores the idea that rampant climate alarmism is resulting in more quote unquote climate doomers. These are people that are so convinced of the existential threat of climate change that they have essentially become apathetic to the entire thing. So we're all doomed and there's nothing that we can do about it. So the story comes hot on the heels of the latest IPCC report, which was released a week or so ago, which spelled out various doom and gloom scenarios. It was the subject of the um, Heartland's latest climate change roundtable show last week. So if you want to check that out, they talk more about it. Um, but the report generated headlines like scientists issue final warning on climate change and all of these just like the sky is falling type of things. And you, as you might suspect, the endless apocalyptic prognostications lead people to not become increasingly resolute in their fight against climate change, but instead depressed and apathetic to the entire topic. At one point, the author quotes the author, one of the authors of the latest IPCC report saying, quote, it's fair to say that recently many of us climate scientists have spent more time arguing with doomers than with deniers so they run through a number of stories about teenagers and other people asking questions like you know why should i go to college if we're all going to be dead in a couple of years why should i start a family if we're all going to be dead in a couple of years why should i save money for the future if the future is going to be nothing but death and destruction and the ipcc author's response to this is uh, 12 years to save the planet was actually we have 12 years to cut global emissions and have to stay consistent with the 1.5 degrees Celsius scenario. Then 12 years to save the planet becomes interpreted as the public as, you know, if we don't stop climate change in 12 years, we're all going to die. <laughs> so like this is it, it kind of is interesting that there's almost like a backlash or a uh, unintended consequences of backfiring, you might say, about this rhetoric. That uh, instead of galvanizing people into, you know, realizing that this is the most important thing in the world, you're actually causing them to be like, throw up their arms. Like, well, I guess we're all screwed. <laughs> so, so Jim, uh, I feel like you haven't talked in a minute. What's, what's your yeah. opinion on this story? Well, uh, first of all, I, I told you this, uh, this morning, I said that the subhead to that Washington Post story is how UN reports are and confusing headlines created a generation of people who believe climate change can't be stopped. Now, see, we, there's a problem right there. 
<laughs> this right. idea that humans can control the climate, that that we can stop climate change. We cannot stop climate change. We have no effect on whether a new ice age is coming or a, a new, you know, what they used to call the 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 optimum of a warmer planet. I mean, yes, CO2 is is maybe contributing on the margins, but we cannot stop climate change. Yet we have these generations of kids have been raised to think that they are the ones, you know, human activity is what drives the climate. And and again, and then you mentioned the one the the idea that uh you know oh we didn't we didn't make we didn't want you to panic so much that you would just give up. We want you to panic so that you will uh, be motivated into action and to go towards socialism and to and to reduce you know get rid of fossil fuels and so that you could be controlled a lot easier. That's what we wanted to do. Sorry. So yeah, it's not really 12 years and the world ends. It's 12 years to cut emissions by half so that we can make uh, so that we can stay within the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, limit that we put on ourselves. Mm. That limit was pulled out of the air. It was it was a number that was negotiated in Paris. I remember right. I was there because they wanted to say two degrees and then other people wanted to say 1.4. They ended up at 1.5. And the idea that cutting uh, carbon carbon dioxide emissions in half will keep us there. Nobody knows that. Even if we were able to do that, which we won't, because China and, and India are just going to just keep emitting as much CO2 as they feel like it because they're not insane. And China's building two new coal plants every single week while we're shutting them down in this country. So so there's it's so ridiculous. And But these people are panicked. These young people are panicked because they actually have believed this. They've been taught this their entire lives. I mean, just real quick, you know, there were there were two recent surveys asking young people about their level of climate anxiety. There was one in September of 2021 that was in Lancet, again, a very prestigious academic journal. They, 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 they surveyed 10,000 young people in 10 countries around the world. 77% said the future is frightening. 68% they felt sad or feel anxious about it. 50% said they were angry and felt powerless and helpless and guilty about coming <laughs> climate change because it's their fault. Uh, Google searches for the term climate anxiety rose 565 percent in, in the year of 2021. Uh, and then there was another Yale study that was just from this December called climate change in the American mind. And uh, nine percent of those they surveyed reported being unable to stop or control their worry about global warming. And seven percent said they had experienced diminished interest or pleasure in doing anything in their lives because they're so worried about global warming. And so, you know, if you spend decades indoctrinating children, they grow up to believe this nonsense. They actually what they become are members of your cult. This is a cult. And these people uh, are losing their minds and they are miserable because they've been indoctrinated unwillingly into a cult. Yeah, I mean, Chris, can you really like blame these people for feeling this way? I mean, you hear all this gloom and doom. The media is just like 100 percent just talking about all this gloom and doom and everything. And then their only salvation is Al Gore and, and John Kerry. And, and you have to count on them to convince countries like China and India and Russia to end their use of reliable energy. It seems like an impossible task. <laughs> like, So I don't know. What are your thoughts on this? Okay, well, I'm going to take it in a little different direction. I think that the the fear that has you know been inflicted by the global warming, uh, you know, climate change people for you know many many years now is all for power because fear and totalitarianism go hand in hand. You 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 make the uh, population very fearful, but from an outside threat, whether it's you know capitalism or whether it's you know the climate change or whether it's a pandemic. And then they are much more willing to be compliant and they're much more willing to give up their liberties. And I think that what the topic that we were talking about uh, before, where, you know, th there's calls to put, you know, oil executives uh, on on trial. I think that's all, just all part of this 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 whole uh, tide that is being, you know, uh, put on people. And it's just a, it's it's all about creating as much fear as possible because when people are fearful, they're willing to give up, you know, their rights and their freedoms, and that empowers uh, the Al Gore's, the Joe Biden's, the Barack Obama's, the John Kerry's of the world who want to control people's lives at a microscopic level. Yeah, well, what do you think about that, Justin? Because it's like 
you know, if this was a manageable problem, right? Like the, the, the idea that's giving these people like the, the climate doomer type of thought is that this is an unmanageable problem, that there's nothing that you could possibly do about it. If it was a manageable problem, it's just like, it's just a matter of you making sure you turn the lights off when you, you know, walk out the room or use energy saving light bulbs or something that you could actually do like that would inspire some, uh, some kind of personal accountability. Whereas this unmanageable problem, it's like you almost have to rely on some crazy seismic change. Like, you know, the, a bill that, uh, you know, these politicians pass in Congress or something is not going to do it. Like that, the, these, these climate doomers think that we're well past that. We need some type of Hail Mary solution. We need a total fundamental rewrite of every industry and all of that stuff. A great uh, reset. A, a great, great reset, reset of, of yeah. everything. So what are your thoughts on that? And this is going to be final words because we're already about to hit the hour mark. Go ahead, the, the, J Jim, I think it was Jim touched on this a little bit before, and this is really the key to understanding it. And Anyone who takes this issue seriously, this is why they're clinically, this is why there are people who are clinically depressed from this. This is why people, I'm, well, they're clinically depressed probably because as you pointed out, Donnie, I mean, if you put all of your hope and faith, it, you know, in, in people like John Kerry to solve right. your problems, then you are totally screwed. You might as well just end your life now because you have no chance of, of winning this with John Kerry as the champion of your cause. Right, but right. but the, the real issue, I, I think, is um, it's not it, it doesn't even matter if you completely transform all of the Western world. That doesn't solve the problem. China sure. has to do it, too. India also has to do it. <laughs> Indonesia also has to do it. And this is the problem. Anyone who takes just even a little bit of time, even if you take the position of extreme climate doomsday scenario, Anyone who actually studies the issue for just 20 minutes will quickly come to the conclusion that unless all of those countries go along with these radical things too, and we all know they won't, there is no indication that they will. All the evidence suggests they will not. And everything that's happened over the past few years suggests it's even less likely to happen because you see this realignment with Russia and China and those and countries in the East. They're all... Uh, uh, creating an economic and, and to some extent political and military alliance um, that, that that's the way they're going. So there is no way of solving this problem, even if we take the most radical solutions in the left. So uh, or, or in the, uh, in the West. And so how do you deal with that? What I'm hoping is what I'm hoping so badly is that the people who believe that this really is an existential crisis, who actually believe that in, in the West, who won't, listen to reason on some of these other things that they will at least come to the conclusion not that they should stop living their lives that they shouldn't have kids or that life is just miserable but rather that if they're if you are going to support some kind of public policy solution the only rational rational reasonable thing that you could possibly do is say uh we just have to deal with the effects of it when they come and whatever those effects are, we're going to have to deal with those from a public policy perspective right. if and when they come. And then that has to be it. There is nothing else that you can do. And I hope that they at least come because I can accept that as well. You know, that's something we can all agree on. If it turns out that climate change is causing sea level rise and we're all having these massive problems with cities being swallowed up by the ocean, then okay, we're going to have to deal with that. So let's wait for that to happen when it looks like that's about to occur then let's deal with it from a public policy perspective in a realistic way. But the idea that you are going to be able to uh, get China and Indonesia and Russia and all these massive countries, which are far more likely to, uh, to grow a, outgrow us over a long period of time, the idea that you're going to get them to do the things that John Kerry wants them to do is completely insane. There is right. no chance of success on that on that front. Yep, and that uh, that music playing means that we are long here, so we're going to wrap up the episode. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us for this episode of the In the Tank podcast. Join us every week for a new episode. Like I said, for those audio-only listeners that are catching this show on a Friday, you can join us a day earlier on Thursdays at noon central time where we are streaming live on Facebook and YouTube and Rumble and Twitter. You can join the conversation, throw your comments and uh, questions in the chat. Maybe we'll show your comments on the screen. Maybe we'll address your questions on the fly and all so you can help us out by just doing a couple of things. Those audio only listeners leaving a review for us on iTunes would be greatly appreciated. Those watching on YouTube, hitting that like button, subscribe button, sharing this content, or even leaving a comment underneath this video will all help break through those big tech algorithms that prevent content like this from being shown to more people. 
Jim Lakely, where can the fine people find you? At Jay Lakely on Twitter, at Heartland Inst on Twitter, probably in a global prison near you in a few years. <laughs> and always visit heartland.org. That's right. Justin Haskins, same question. At Justin T. Haskins on Facebook, Twitter, Getter, and Parlor. And I don't know if there is any other. So normally I say every other platform, but I think that's probably it. Truth Social? Are you on Truth Social? I am on Truth Social. Of course you are. Chris Talgo, what do you have to pitch today? Stoppingsocialism.com and uh, heartland.org, as always. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this episode. We'll talk to you next week.